it's been a while. Uh, I'm just trying something something new. Uh, instead of doing a record of videos, I just want to try doing live videos instead. Uh, I'm not sure how is that going to work turn out, but <clears throat> for for my first test, uh, as the title of this live video is should be stating, uh, I'm going to be going through the new Unearth Arcana that came out from Wizards today. And it's actually quite an interesting one. I wasn't expecting them to produce this Anna Fakana. And it's, uh, from my first impressions, it's actually something that's been wanted for a pretty long time. And it could be a hint as, uh, as to what Wizard is planning for you know, their next book or adventure or some kind. Uh, from what I understand, there seems to be already some hints that, or at least some mechanics that will be, that will be in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Uh, they will be spell jamming, so I'm not sure how does this new Anuf Akana fit in, or is or are they still in the stage of, or is or are they still in the stage of trying to uh, fine tune, fine tune their mechanics for the for space jam for spell jamming, but I highly doubt it because it's already going to be released very soon. It's, I think it should already be released in some stores already in America. So this Anafakana of Ships and the Sea, uh, which deals only with uh, naval-related rules for ships and, com and I think even combat, uh, is, it's a sign of what wizards are planning and what they are thinking. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I have no insight into what, what they will be using these rules for. But yeah, I mean, um, naval, comp naval rules has always been something that uh, I, I've seen being asked for for a very, very long time. And even though there are some uh, rules for uh, underwater uh, combat and as well as some uh, vehicles with like boats uh, listed in the PHB, uh, there hasn't been a very robust set of uh, 5e mechanics when it comes to naval combat. So I have the uh, Anafakana up PDF open right in front of me right now. Uh, I know it's probably going to look very odd um, that you know you just you you're just going to hear me. Uh, you're just going to be seeing me instead of the PDF. Uh, I've tried to do a stream test today from my from my PC, but it doesn't seem to work out. So. We'll just have to use this for now, and it's probably not going to look very pretty. But uh, I'll just be giving most of you guys my live reactions, and while I'm reading through, and I'll be like reading aloud just to uh, just to tell you which parts of the PDF that I'm currently reading through at the moment. And for, first things first, usually when I get a Anuf Arcana PDF, or actually even like even like a rules PDF or some kind or a rules supplement of some kind, I, do, I try to give it a very like initial glance uh, I want to I want to I usually want to see how the whole document itself is uh, broken down to so looking at this PDF uh, it's, it's the, the main headers are uh, ship stat blocks and there's like an example a bunch of holes it's like the, the majority of the whole PDF I think is taken up just by just sample stat blocks of ships and all kinds and then you have uh, rules for officers crew uh travel at sea and what else we have uh ships in combat um crashing owning a ship and yeah that's about it so it's a this looks like, looks like trying to be as very comprehensive as it can um i think it's trying to like create this whole entire ecosystem of rules of of own of uh running uh naval related Avengers or combat and all that, so it's a good start. It's a good start. It's a nine. It's a nine page. It's a nine page PDF. So that's actually qu covering quite a lot of ground in nine pages. I would say. Uh, from some of the subheadings, I see the like environmental hazards, um, special uh, downtime. So that's a. These are use. These are sticking on to some of the current mechanics that Five E has at the moment, uh, which is a good thing for me because I never really like when D and D introduces entirely new mechanics uh, that just adds on to the base mechanics that's already existing. I always felt that 5e is always stronger when uh, it, 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 it expands on its current mechanics rather than adding on new mechanics which is going to cause the whole system blow. 
like what 3.5 went through. So yeah, this looking promising at the moment. So let's just get back to the beginning and let's start with uh, ship stat blocks. Now ship stat blocks looks to me like, okay, you know, because you already have object rules in uh, DMD, I believe. And I wasn't expecting them to have stat blocks, uh, create stat blocks for ships. But uh, it seems to me here, ship stat block give game details for use when the ship is involved in combat or other situations where its defensive or offensive capabilities are relevant. The stat block has three base main parts, basic, ex basic statistics, action options, and the ship's components. Ships can't take any actions on their own. Without any effort from its crew, a ship might drift on the water, come to a stop, or careen out of control. So, looking at the basic statistics, statistics uh, it looks like they are tr trying to stat the ships as though they are like monsters. Uh, even the framework of the statistics looks like it's very similar to what you will see in the monster manual. Um, it looks like inside looks like, so you have size. Most ships are large, huge, or gigantic. The ship's category is determined by its length and width, whichever is longer. For instance, a ship that is ten feet long and twenty feet wide would use a size category of twenty foot, which means the ship is gigantic. Okay, basic stuff there. Uh, so say if this if something is longer in length, uh, then you would just use the closest size to that. So Gargantua, I think, is the largest size now in uh, 5e. Uh, so I think most, I miss most gigantic ships like you know, the battleships or, you know, keels. Uh, warships will probably fit into that category. And then you will have uh, smaller ships. But I think the smallest, in, I think what they're trying to say here, the smallest size of, the smallest ships will be a size of large at least because of the, maybe the length and the width of the ship. So there will be uh, at least 10 feet across either way in either direction. No. Space. A ship doesn't have a space square space unless it's stat block specified otherwise. A ship that is 20 foot long and 10 feet wide occupies a 20 foot by 10 feet space. The ship can't move in the space, it's too small to accommodate. So alright, so this is uh, a little exception to the normal spacing rules uh, for for creatures. Uh, that if the, whatever the space is stated or whatever the size is stated for the ship, it, it, it covers exactly that amount of space. So, unlike the creature spacing rules from five from PHP, it says that even though a creature, a medium-sized creature, is uh, has a space of five feet, it doesn't mean that they occupy exactly five up to five feet. They are just have, they just they just fit into that square and they have the control of the rest of the five feet. Okay, moving on. We have capacity of ships. That plus indicates how many creatures and how much cargo can carry. Creatures include both the crew required to operate the vessel and any passenger who might ride along. Passengers could include marines who re re repel borders and lead the attack on monsters and enemy ships. Okay, this is pretty much standard stuff that you expect from from a ship, a ship that you know carrying carrying cargo. Uh, I think I may have to take a few glances. Sorry, a few glances through the stat, the uh, ability stats, and it says that. Uh, they will, they will put the number of uh, capacity in terms of cargo, uh, in terms of tonnage, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how they, I'm not, I haven't seen anything in terms of creature numbers, but maybe that's something you, that something that might happen in the sense that you have to calculate the, the total weight of all the creatures involved, plus the cargo they are carrying, and then see whether it matches to the tonnage. Although they never mentioned anything about what happens if the sh uh, ship is a, uh, you know, overloaded, like, in, like, is there any kind of sinking rules or something like that? A ship's travel pace determines how far the vessel can move per hour per day, all right? This is standard stuff. You will find this in the travel pace rules for, uh, in the PHB, as well as I think, uh, they even provide the, the number of distance by the, by the ship. Ability scores. A ship has six ability scores, right? Okay, that's interesting. Which is corresponding to the whole monster really monster style of uh, statting. A ship's strength represents its size and weight. Dexterity represents the ship's ease of handling. A ship's constitution covers its durability and the quantity of cons construction. Ships can usually have a score of zero. Usually have a score of zero intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Okay, fine. So, I thought that I thought there were probably be stats for thinking ships, talking ships. If the ship has a zero in score, it automatically fails any ability check or saving throw that uses that score. So that's a little interesting because if there are some spells that would affect uh, things that would affect different stats, so I'm not sure how it would ha what would happen if someone casts a spell 
yeah, uses something like a intelligence charisma save and then the ship fails and takes, I don't know, psychic damage or other kinds of damages. Uh, vulnerabilities, resistance, and immunities. A ship's vulnerabilities, resistance, and immunities apply to all of its components unless otherwise noted. In the stat block. So typical ship immunities. If you're creating your own ship, you're usually immune to poison and psychic. Okay, so that rules out of quite a number of spells. Once crafted from metal or stone, are also immune to necrotic damage. They are also usually immune to the following conditions. Blinded, charm, deafened, exhaustion, frightened, incapacitated, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, stunned, and unconscious. Okay, that takes out that just rules out like uh, even though the ships are considered <laughs> Possibly creatures, but they they have a lot of they are far more resistant and immune to many conditions and damages that would not really make sense to be able to affect a ship. Components: a ship is composed of different components. Hull: a ship's hull is is basic basic frame on which the other components are mounted. Control: a con control component is used to steer a ship. Movement: a movement component is an element of the ship that enables it to move, such as a set of sails or oars. Weapon. A ship capable of being used in combat has one or more weapon components, each of which is operated separately. These components might have special rules as described in the stat block. Armor class. An armor component has an armor class. Its arm AC is meant to reflect its size, the materials used to construct it, and any defensive plating or armor used to augment toughness. Hit points. A ship component is destroyed and becomes unusable when it destroyed, drops to zero hit points. A ship is ranked if its hull is destroyed. Okay. A ship component does not have hit dice, so that means no resting of any kind. So you can't. So I guess that that brings up the question of how do you repair ships? Like if you if the ship uh, doesn't repair itself by resting, then some kind of downtime activity is probably needed to recover its hit points. Damage threshold. Okay, this is the this is the rules for objects in Dungeon Master's Guide. Where if the damage doesn't reach a certain damage threshold, it doesn't damage the ship's hit points at all. Uh, if a ship component has a damage threshold, that threshold appears after its hit points. A component, is a component has immunity to all damage unless it takes an amount of damage equal to or greater than its damage threshold, in which case it takes damage as normal. Any damage that falls to meet, that fails to meet or exceed the damage threshold is considered superficial and doesn't reduce the component's hit points. Alright. Actions. This part of the stat block specifies what the ship can do on its turn using its special actions rather than the actions used by creatures. It even relies on its actions to move, it doesn't have a move otherwise. <laughs> okay, so we're going into the sample set blocks, and I think there's like one, one, two, three, four, four pages worth of this. And the first one is everyone's favorite, an airship. So gargantuan vehicle 80 by 20 creature capacity, 20 crew, 10 passengers, alright, so that's good. So there's a creature capacity and there's well as a cargo capacity. So it, there's a number of creatures it can hold and there's a number of uh, tonnage it can hold. Uh, travel pace, 9 miles per hour, 216 miles per day, alright. Uh, strength, strength 14, strength dex 14, con 12, uh, 0 for the rest. Damage immunity, poison psychic. Uh, this, one, <coughs> this one does not say necrotic as it's not made of stone. Uh, Conditions, condition immunities are all the ones that I mentioned above, I think. I'm not, I'm not going to check again. Most likely, it's pretty much the same because you, I wouldn't understand why it's a ship made unconscious. So it has a hull of AC-13, hit points 300. It has a, action, it has a control helm, uh, AC-16, hit points 50. I'm not seeing where the damage threshold is for this airship, so... It might be something that's left out, or it looks like it uh, doesn't have one, which is pretty strange to me because that, that actually makes this uh, airship pretty fragile in the sense that every damage taken is going to be re a reduction to its hit points. Uh, control helm, hit points, move up to speed of its elemental engine with 190 degree turn. If the helm is destroyed, the airship can't turn. Alright, movement. Like, Alright, movement. It's, so that's the movement component. Elemental engine. AC 80 hit points 100, minus 20 speed per 25 damage taken. Locomotion, air, elemental power, speed 80 feet. If the engine is destroyed, the ship immediately crashes. So this is something that might, might we need to pay attention to, is that uh, 
in terms of the movement component, it will have a certain amount of hit points and then uh, damage dealt to it would reduce the, 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 its speed. Now, uh, weapons, 4 ballistas, they see 50, hit points 50, range attack, range weapon attack, plus 6 to hit, range hunger 20 to 40 hunger 80 feet, on target, hit 16, uh, 3d10 piercing damage. On its turn, the airship can use its helm to move using its elemental engine, it can also use fire as the ballistas, if it has half its crew or fuel work, it can only fire 2 of the ballistas. So this is a interesting way to stat, I think, uh, is that uh, it has all so every component has its own actions in the ship uh, and during its turn it can perform all those actions and provided that whatever requirements that's needed for example like uh, the number of crew like for example for example if there's four ballistas uh, it can fire all four but if it loses half its crew it can only fire two but then on top of that it can still move uh, its speed or according to the element according to the movement component so that's for the airship, and we'll be moving on. Uh, the next one is the galley. Uh, I might skip, I, might, I don't think I'll be reading through all the sample stats provided. Uh, I'll be, but I'm trying to look for some highlights and some differences and to see like what's, how this whole thing all fits together in the, pic, in the larger picture. So galley has 80 crew, 40 passengers, 150 tonnage, 4 miles, 96 miles per day. So much, much slower compared to the airship. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure. Like, is there a way to increase the speed of a uh, of a ship? So, <laughs> twenty four strength, four dex, twenty twenty constitution, uh, standard can damage immunities and condition immunities. Uh, okay, so this is where we start to see the damage threshold being included. Hull is AC 15, hit points 500 with a damage hull threshold of 20. So it needs to do a minimum of at least 20 damage to be able to reduce the hull. Okay, armor control helm, alright, move up to the speed of its movement components with 90 degree turn. Uh, helm is destroyed, the galley can't turn. So that's going to be a consistent theme. Once the hull, uh, once the helm, the control helm of the ship is destroyed it would not be able to maneuver as well it will probably just be going in a straight line uh, movement sails ac 12 hit points 10 minus 10 feet speed per 25 damage taken all right so we're already seeing that thing there locomotion sails water sails speed 35 feet 15 feet while sailing into the wind 50 feet while sailing with the wind okay so galley here. So the galley here is going to have a different. It's a bit different right now. It has two movement components. Uh, one is using the sails, the other is using the oar. So I think there's a there's a whole question of uh, the 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 controller, which hasn't been stated who is the controller yet, or maybe it moves on its own, uh, own initiative account. Uh, that I guess the person who controls the ship has to make the choice of. Uh, wh which movement component they will be using to move to, or depending on which speed of the movement component they are using so let's see <coughs> going down to weapons so weapons has four ballistas pretty much the same thing and two magonels which is pretty much catapult and a ram so it has two weapon components uh, also has different AC different hit points Actually, now that's coming, that's bringing up uh, a question for me is that uh, how do you, if someone attacks a ship, how do, do, do they get, I mean, do they get to decide which part of the components they want to attack with? Because this is basically a, this is basically a monster with uh, different, like more, more than, more than at least four, uh, four range of hit points, which is, which is, Gonna be interesting. I mean, like there has to be a certain tactic to decide to which which to attack. Like, if should you attack the weapons first, or should you take out the hull, or should you take out the control so they doesn't have to maneuver. So I think that we're gonna be this gonna be addressed later on in the naval combat section. So on its for its actions of the galley, uh, the galley can move its helm. It can fire its ballistas and its magonels. If it has half its crew or fewer, it moves at half speed. It can only fire half of its weapons. 
So that's interesting because uh, so if the if the galley screw is already halved, uh, does that mean that the half speed applies to all its movement components, including sails and including oars? Uh, I guess some people would have a, some problem with that because they would think like uh, sails doesn't really depend on the crew. But you can also argue conversely that you know uh, without without the proper number of men uh, calling up and letting go the sails and all that. Yeah, there is some fact. There is some uh, factor in of why uh, a reduced number of crew would also affect the speed of a uh, things like a sail. Okay, so I'm going through keel boat right now. Uh, nothing here that I think seems out of the ordinary. So I think we just skip that. Uh, we have the long ship next. Uh, forty crew, five miles. Uh yeah, so I guess that's pretty much the pattern for for water for for waterborne vehicles. Uh, not sure how this is gonna turn out. Uh, I mean it's a very it's definitely a very simplifying way to do ship stats. Uh, but it's already a detachment from how the object rules are currently in the DMG, and that's not something that I'm always a fan of because I kind of want you know some consist consistency. In terms of how objects are stated and how vehicles are stated, and I don't know. I mean, if this is something that we just want to go ahead doing, uh, then usually people will start asking like, I uh, would there be like an errata or would there be like a supplement to stat other vehicles, for example, like carriages, landbound ones, uh, air ones we've already seen. Uh, but I think that might that. Uh, Air travel, air travel vehicles probably needs a little more expansion into what it can do. So okay, that was the long ship. Uh, going through sailing ships now. Sailing ships doesn't look any different to me. So I guess yeah, they pretty much just uh, comes down to some very basic, uh, very some some basic framework. We just love minor variations among among them. Uh, and then we have the warship. Okay, I think I'll just skip the rest. All right. Uh, going into the next section is officers. If you like to explore running a ship, it needs officers to oversee operations. Officers fill six different roles. A person can fill only one role at a time, though multiple people can be assigned to a single role. Some roles aboard a ship reflect the need for trained experts to direct a crew's efforts. Others focus on keeping the crew's health, morale, and order. Each row is described below, along with the abilities and proficiencies that help a character excel at it, but they aren't required. So you have so you have six roles, six different roles: the captain, the first mate, the bosun, boatswain, the quartermaster, the surgeon, and the cook. All right. Uh. This one doesn't look like it has any mechanical uh, rules per se, but it has to be assigned. I'm assuming it has to be assigned to a character or whichever character or NPC has to take up the role. So they're only giving things like recommendations of who should take the role. For example, like the captain. The captain has high intelligence and charisma scores as well as proficiency with water vehicles and intimidation and persuasion skills. So I'm not seeing exactly how... Uh, Having the officer is is playing a part in the rules for right now. Uh, maybe you be more apparent as I go a little bit further. So I think we we'll just skip this for now because since there's no like mechanical discussions worth having here. Uh, so we move on to crew. A ship requires a number of able-bodied sailors to crew it, as specified in the stat block. Crew skill, experience, and health are defined by its quantity quality score. A crew starts with a quality score of plus 4, and that score varies over time, going as low as minus 10 or as high as plus 10. It decreases as crew crit takes casualties, suffers hardship, or endures poor health. It increases as the crew enjoys high morale, has good health care, and receives clear fair leadership. A typical crew member uses the commoner step block in the monster manual. Okay? Uh, so I think it gets a little bit complex here with, the thing, with a thing called quality score. So let's see how that affects anything. Uh, loyalty and quality. When dealing with an individual member of the crew, you might find it useful to use the optional loyalty rules from Chapter 4, the Dungeon Master's Guide. Okay, very interesting. Uh, already being embedded inside this uh, new uh, 
uh, optional rules is using extra rules from the DMG, which is also something I always appreciate. Uh, to convert a quality score to an individual's loyalty score, add 10 to the crew's quality score. That's a lot, isn't it? That's plus, plus 10 to quality score to individual's loyalty score, add 10 to the crew's quality score. Yeah, that's quite a lot. Like the base is already 14, but I haven't really gone, I've never really read the loyalty rules, so I'm not exactly sure what's, what impact is this going to have on, on either quality score or loyalty score. <laughs> Alright. Mutiny. A poorly led or mistreated crew might return against officers once per day. If a crew's quality score is lower than 10, the captain must make a charisma intimidation or persuasion check modified by the crew's quality score. Okay. If the, true, if the check is... To, is if the check total is between 1 and 9, the crew's quality score decreases by 1. Okay, the check is only crew quality. If the check total is 0 or lower, ah, alright. Your crew mutinies. They become hostile to the officers and might attempt to kill them, imprison them, or throw them overboard. A crew can be cowed into obedience through violence or offer treasure and other rewards. When the DM is mutiny, the quality decreases by 1d4. Alright, so that's that's the reason why you want to keep the quality score up as high as possible so that uh, there's, a less, there's a lesser modifier to your charisma intimidation or persuasion check and you only have to make these checks if your quality score is less than zero. Less than, ze less than zero which means it's going to the negatives and each negative is going to affect your charisma check and if your check result is less than 10, then uh, it's between 1 to 0, then nothing happens. If it's less, if your charisma check total is 0 or lower, so you have to be 0 twice. Uh, 0 quality score and then 0 on the check before your crew mutinies. That's actually pretty, a, a pretty big buffer and I'm not sh I don't think there's any risk of uh, rolling badly if your quality score is not less than 0. So let's say your quality score is at negative one and then you roll a one assuming no charisma modifiers, then only your quality your check, your charisma check would be zero and therefore causes a mutiny. So that's actually a pretty big yeah, that's actually a pretty safe buffer that it's quite unlikely to happen unless you know conditions have been really, really bad. And that's interesting because you if by having this quality score thing uh, that means players or whoever is controlling the ship uh, would have to be pretty pretty careful to make sure their quality score doesn't drop too low. Uh, it would be something like a death, like a death save or something like that to avoid to avoid uh, you know disaster from happening. And that's something I think that uh, whoever's using this rule should be very aware of. Okay, shore leave. Uh, life aboard a ship is constant wear on the crew. Spending time in port allows the crew to relax and regain composure. If a crew's quality score is 3 or lower, the score increases by 1 for each day the crew spends on shore or on port or ashore. So that's already one way to restore uh, quality, uh, quality score. And it can only go up to a maximum of 3. So that means if, you were quality, if your quality score was at 0, uh, just spend 3 days off. On, on, on shore and it will be back up to 3 and then it will lose its, its effectiveness. So that's alright. Uh, although I was hoping there would be other ways to recover uh, quality score, I don't know, maybe with some sort of charisma check or maybe there were like other downtown activities that the, D, the, the, the DM could allow the players to do to increase quality score beyond 3. So there might be a reason why uh, Mike Merles or Wizards is deciding to put uh, put a cap on tree. Uh, we'll see. So, yeah, okay. This is a I'm 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 okay with this mechanic so far. Uh, it has its purpose. Uh, not sure how many people will really like to follow them, but you know, we'll, let's just continue on. So this is really page six. I have like three pages left. Okay. Uh, travel at sea. Here are the rules to help adjudicate travel at sea, specifically travel of an hour or more. This material builds on the travel rules in the player's handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide. Okay, let's see what about that. Tra ship travel pace. Ships travel at the speed given at their stat block. Unlike with land speed, players can't choose to move at a faster pace, though they can choose to go slower. 
If a ship's mode of movement takes damage, it might be slowed. For every decrease of 10 feet in speed, reduce the ship's pace by 1 mile per hour and 24 miles per day. Okay, this is going to be a bit confusing because um, each, stat, each stat block that I've seen so far has already included uh, what happens to the speed of the, sh of the ship in the movement component when it takes a certain amount of damage, usually like 25. And now here he's saying like for every decrease of 10 feet in speed. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. Okay. So this is all right. So this actually explains it. So for example, if the ship, uh, for example, if the component of the ship takes damage, right, let's just find an example here. That's the closest one here. Uh, okay. Uh, warship. So the warship has a uh, movement component of sails and oars. Uh, with sails, it goes at 35 feet. Uh, 15 while sailing into wind, 50 while sailing with the wind. And uh, with the oars, it goes uh, has a speed of 20 feet with 80 or more rowers, 10 feet with with 40 or more rowers, 5 feet with 20 or more rowers. Uh, that's a little confusing because uh, the warship has 40 crew and 60 passengers, but doesn't mention. Uh, how many of those are rowers? So I'm assuming uh, rowers are already included in the 60, 60 crew and 40, 60 passenger numbers. Although I'm not sure if they are, they are allowing the passengers to be the rowers as well. You know, because typically it might be uh, like slaves, so they're not really counted as crew. Uh, and, this, and yeah, because the warship allows for 80 rowers. So I'm guessing 80 roll, rowers would include 60 passengers and maybe 20 crew, but that's a little strange. Anyways, so, so for example now, let's say if the sails takes, uh, takes 25 damage and reduces its uh, speed from 35 feet to 25 feet, uh, that's going to affect the speed the the distance the its speed its uh hour speed and daily and daily speed so yeah so it would be ten uh one mile or twenty four miles reduction uh respectively for hour and day all right uh, they haven't have they given the speed rule speed for day and hour i think they did i was just maybe i just wasn't paying attention oh they didn't oh yes all right all right travel pace right okay it's on the top it's not under the movement compo movement components of the of the stats all right so one mile or 24 miles uh by hour and by day that's actually a pretty big uh reduction considering like warship only has four miles so if it loses 40 feet uh, to its speed in the movement component, uh, practically it goes to zero miles per hour. So that's going to be a little weird, like that's going to be hard to explain uh, in terms of uh, role playing. Like, so mechanically the speed moves zero miles per hour, but how come the ship can, uh, it's like the ship literally just uh, floating by itself and it's not really that hard to reduce the speed of the uh, of the movement because it only reduces 10 feet uh, I'm not sure I think there's, there's probably a better way to streamline this rather than just putting an arbitrary number but you know that's the best part of uh, having an Anna Fakana right now so you can do the play test and to be honest I'm not really, really sure if I have a chance to play test this uh, and I'll probably say why in a different video but you know it's good to just dissect uh, and and analyze these rules right now as it is and let's just to see if it really just makes sense at the moment so going back to travel at sea we have the activity while traveling section uh, activities available to a ship's crew and passengers are a bit different from the options available to group traveling by land which is in the PHB uh, a number of activities are restricted to certain officers Ah, okay. So that's makes makes a little makes makes a bit more sense of why certain rules matter. 
uh, unless the DM rules otherwise. Okay, give the power to the DM. For example, a bard might be allowed to engage in the raised moral activity by playing baldy songs on deck to lift the crew's spirits. The party's pace has no effect on the activities they engage while or activities they can engage in while traveling by ship. Alright, uh, I'm not sure why they had to mention that. Uh, well, it's good to be clear. Uh, although I'm not very sure why if the party was traveling at fast pace on land uh, would be able to affect uh, the activities. So I guess that's true. I guess uh, if you were traveling fast pace, you technically couldn't stealth. But then... I don't see any. I don't see the characters doing the stealthing when it comes to you know stealth rules for the ship. I suspect there might be its own rules for how to stealth ships and deciding the pace. And it's already it, like I read bef before this. They already mentioned that uh, the ships can't determine. They can't determine the pace. It can only have its own normal pace or a slower pace. So I'm not really sure how this fits in later on. Probably something, yeah. It'll probably come in pictures somewhere. So the down, so the activities while traveling are draw a map, forage. Okay, pretty much the same thing. Raise morale. Right. So that I think that's the one that will increase the quality score. Uh, first mates only. So only first mates can raise morale. The first mate can manage to cruise time to grant extended breaks, provide instruction, and improve morale. Once per day, if the crew's morale quality score is 3 or lower, the first mate can make the DC Charisma, DC 15 Charisma position check. On a successful check, the crew's quality score increases by 1. So again, that, that strange cap of 3, uh, but at least this is one way to increase morale uh, above 3. Uh, although, that can only like, be done once, so unless, unless it was already lower than 3, for example, like he needed to make 2 checks to increase a uh, quality score of 1 up to 3. Okay, uh, still not seeing it, but let's move on. Uh, navigate, Quartermaster only. The Quartermaster can try to prevent the group from becoming lost, making a wisdom survival check when the DM calls for it. So same, Ross, same loss rules uh, like in the DMG, uh, except that this one, this one is tied to a specific role. So, okay, um, I guess that can kind of be reverse applied to no normal traveling rules in the, DM in the PHP and DMG as the who is the navigator, uh, who is the forager, who is the map maker and all that. Okay, uh, noticing threats, okay, spotters. Uh, use the passive wisdom perception score of the character or the crew to determine whether anyone on the ship notices a hidden threat. The crew has a passive wisdom perception score equal to 10 plus crew's quality score. Hmm, okay, interesting. The DM might decide that a track can be noticed only by characters in a specific area of the ship. For example, only characters below deck might have a chance to hear or spot a creature hiding on board. Below deck, hiding on board. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I thought noticing track was going to be referring to ships, like other ships, like, uh, you know, preparing for naval combat. But it seems to be applying to things like things that are happening within the ship. Uh, not sure how is that how is that gonna work really well, but uh, it sounds like it sounds like uh, players need to like assign somebody to like patrol around the ship to make sure that nothing funny happens. Uh, okay, um, not sure. Yeah, just not sure what I, what it was trying to do. Okay, repair. It can be only done by the bosun. The ship's bosun can undertake its activity at the end of the day. The bosun can make a strength check using carpenter's tools. On a, D on a 15 or higher, each damage component regains hit points equals to 1d6 plus the crew's quality score, minimum of 1 hit points. That's not a lot considering uh, 1d6. And considering that uh, some hit, hit points for some of the components can go up to like 500, that's going to take a lot of days just to fix uh, something, a component back to full. Uh, I mean like even if it's take, like 500 hit points, it's, take, it's down to 300 hit points. That's 200 damage worth of repairs to do. Uh, might have been better if there was some kind of mechanic that allows like if like there were more in people involved in the repair, then the number of dice roll would be higher. Uh, but it's a good, it's a good uh, framework or start to start with. 
So maybe it's, maybe something to be improved on in the final version. All right, stealth. Okay, so since since there's a replacement of you can't do uh, slow pace. If there was uh, you can't you uh, you can't you can't you can't stealth or do whatever in the slower pace. So I guess this is a, supposed to be the substitute version of the. Uh, ship rules. Uh, captain only. The ship's captain can engage in this activity only if the weather conditions restrict visibility such as in heavy fog. The ship makes a dexterity check equal with a bonus equal to the ship's quality score to determine if you can hide. So a lot of things, a lot of these checks are, are being tied to quality score. Uh, which is something I'm not very sure because if you can go as high as it takes a real effort to go as high as plus 10 but there's nothing that there, there's nothing so far I've read that allows it to go higher than uh, to modify the quality score to be more than three so still looking for ways of increasing quality score uh, and it's and it's important to do so because it affects your know, uh, skill checks ability checks that re that you know uh, instead of using the modifiers of a character, it uses the modifier of the ship entirely, which is the quality score. So, yeah. Still not really too happy about that part. Uh, moving on to hazards. So, hazards come in two basic types. Environmental hazards such as storms, turbulent waters, and other events such as fire aboard the ship, or a plague outbreak. Okay, environmental outbreak, environmental hazards. Uh... Fluff, 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 fluff. Each day a ship spends involved in a hazard requires the officers to make each make a special ability check as shown in the hazard checks table. This check takes the place of any other activities that the officer might undertake and represents the officer's contribution to keeping the ship afloat. So, so okay. So it's tied to a role and the check that they need to make. For example, the... Uh, Captain makes an intelligence water vehicles check. A first mate makes a charisma intimidation check. Uh, Bosun makes a strength carpenters tool check. Quartermaster makes wisdom nature check. Surgeon makes intelligence medicine check. And cook makes constitution cook utensils check. Uh, if there is no one available to make a check, treat the result as a zero. Wow. Okay. Finally, roll a d20 for the crew using its abilities quality score as modifier to the roll. Add up all these checks and refer to the hazard check uh, result table. That table shows if the ship has met with disaster, exist, or surviving the day of the hazard. Okay, uh, some interesting interesting mechanics they're trying to introduce to this. Uh, not sure exactly the reason why they are tying certain uh, like why certain roles can only do a certain certain type of checks. Uh, that's not gonna go too well to explain to players, but uh, it's both a bit uh, unnecessarily complicated, but at the same time, it has a simplified uh, hazard check result table. So, if your check total is 140 plus, and I'm not even sure how to even get 140 plus. One hundred forty plus. That's really high because you only roll a d twenty for the crew. Uh, roll a d twenty for the crew, and you make a check. So, I'm assuming the 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 roll the roll rolls a d twenty, makes the as in the modifier for the check. And then adds a d twenty. Adding with the modifier of the quality score. So I'm not sure how do you actually get 140 out of that, but if you get 140, the cruise quality score increases by one by one for one d four days. Again, very little ways to increase quality score, and in this case, like even though it's the best result, it's only for one d four days. Uh, 105 to 139 success. The ship survives unscathed. 7 to 104. Each component takes one D four D ten bludgeoning damage. The quality quality score is reduced by one. The ship struggles moving at half speed that day. That's already starting to be sound pretty pretty bad, and that's at seventy to one hundred four. Uh, 
0 to 69, the ship's components each take, each take 10 d10 bludgeoning damage. The crew's quality score drops by 2 as several members of the crew are washed overboard and lost. The ship is blown off course and struggles to recover its bearings, failing to cover any distance that day. Okay, pretty drastic uh, results. And 70 to 104. 70 to 104 is partial disaster, but uh, that's actually a pretty big range, I would say. Uh, and, there's, and to come out unscathed of it all is from 105 to 139, which is a much which is a relatively smaller range, uh, I would think. Uh, 35, 31, 139 minus 105 is about 34, and 70 to 104 is about 34. So, okay, fine. Equally, uh, equal, but one's on the higher end and one's on the lower end. So, I'm, I still need to figure out uh, how do they get such high check totals to be more in the hundreds, because that's something you definitely want based on these results. Uh, if you want to add variety to hazards, consider including some interesting complications. Uh, you can also add a su subtract the success threshold and a hazard check to result reflect a hazard danger. If you decide to do so, increase or decrease the threshold. But if I, no, not making sense to me at this moment because I'm still not I'm still not getting how you get such a high check result. Okay, other events. In addition to rough seas and daunting water, a ship might face a number of other other threats. The hazards show the hazards below serve as examples of what a ship can go wrong on a ship. Each one requires a different officer to spend a day dealing with the hazard instead of engaging in other activity. As a rule of thumb, there's a ten percent chance each day that one of the following events occur: emergency maneuvers, conflict, fire, plague, infestations. Okay, uh, so I guess these are supposed to be the random event encount random events slash encounters that happen on ships. Uh, so they look to me just going a brief glance through here. Uh, for example, like fire, a fire at sea can render a ship unable to function. Pick a random component. It takes four D ten fire damage, unless the bosun succeeds on a DC fifteen carpenters too. So yeah, it's basically going to be something like make a certain skill check. Uh, if you fail, something happens like like that. Usually like damage, or uh, decrease of quality score, or disadvantage on checks involving this quality score to ship if you carpenter. Yeah. So. Okay, uh, basically it's just resource drains uh, that can be avoided with, uh, with a good enough uh, skill check by the officers. So I guess we're coming on to the final part which is ship in combat. So ship's in initiative. A ship rolls initiative using its dexterity and it uses its crew quality score as modifier to that roll. So that's interesting. So with a plus three, a uh, quality score of three, they are rolling, the ship rolls 1d20 plus dex plus quality score. Okay, that's probably going to hit some high numbers on that base. Special officer actions. During the encounter, the captain, first mate, and bosun each have access to two special actions described below. Full speed ahead and fire at will. Okay. Full speed ahead. It's an action while on deck. The captain, first mate, or bosun can exhort the crew to work harder and drive a ship forward. Roll a d6 and multiply the result by 5. So that goes up to a minimum of 5 to 30. Apply the total as a bonus to the ship's speed until the end of the ship's next turn. If the bon if this bonus is applied to a ship's speed when the ship is already moving faster than normal, use the higher result. Don't add the two bonuses together. Okay. So I guess there is a way to push speed to be higher. Uh, using this full speed ahead action. Uh, I'm just not really sure is there a reason why you would want to push the speed of a, a ship faster than it already has been pushed to. Uh, so I guess that's the reason why they put wanted to put that clause in to say that use the higher one and never add the two bonuses together, which is very similar to the no stacking of temporary hit point rule. Okay, second action is fire at will. As an action, the captain first mate and bosun. So the captain first mate and bosun seems to have like really, really pivotal, uh, is there, like, are really, really pivotal roles in a ship because not only they can do certain checks, 
uh, they can also avoid certain hazards but they also have play a very big part in uh, in actions as well in what the ship can do okay aid the uh, as an action the captain first mate or both suit aids the crew in aiming one of the ship's weapons select one of the ship's weapons that is within 10 feet of the officer uh, not a favorite mechanic for mine to be to keep track of uh, positions of uh, characters or souls in the ship uh, yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a lot more work than it's than it's worth but anyways uh, since that but that means that based on these rules that uh, only certain roles have to be within certain range of certain weapons only then it can be used not a favorite thing of mine but let's just see where it goes uh, it gains advantage on the next attack roll it makes before the end of the ship's next turn so that means practically when, when if you're running a sh naval combat encounter you have you need to have the ship itself in its uh, actual size you need, you need to have the opponent ship obviously and then you need to put your characters within the ships within the ship and where they are positioned at and then they have to make like movements uh, between different weapons or wherever so the position of the weapons of the on the ship also matters like so that the uh, character slash role is able to move between weapons to give advantage uh, not a very big uh, big issue I would say uh, that the web but the ship can still fire as weapons uh, without with or without the role nearby it's just a matter of uh, tactical advantage okay crashing if a ship moves into the space occupied by a creature or object, it might crash. A ship avoids crashing if the creature or object is at least two sizes smaller than it. So that means uh, for, a, for a large ship, for the smaller ship which is large, uh, they can avoid things that are smaller. They, are, can things, they can avoid things that are small or tiny. So that's not really a lot. That's not really a lot of options unless you're gargantuan, and then only then you can avoid something like medium, medium or huge. Yeah, I think you probably need to clarify that, like with an example or something like that. When a ship crashes, it must immediately make a DC ten Constitution saving throw. Uh, on a failed save, it takes damage to its hull based on the size of the creature or object it crashes into, as shown in the crash damage table. Okay. It also stops moving if the object or is bigger than it or one size smaller. Okay. Otherwise, the ship continues moving and creature object moves to the nearest unoccupied space that is not in the ship's path. At the DM's discretion, an object that is forced to move but is fixed in place is instead destroyed. Okay. Uh, so then, so let's have a look. Uh, if it crashes into a small creature, it takes 1d6 damage to the hull. Medium creatures, 1d10. Large creatures, 4d10. Large, 8d10. And gargantuan, 16d10. So that's not really a lot of damage considering uh, like if you ramp into a gargantuan thing it deals 6d10 which can be as low as 16 to 160 damage uh, that's probably not not enough damage to take out most of the stats uh, most of the ships stated here because they those literally go into the hundreds 100 and 200 especially the hull the hull part the hull component of those ships uh, yeah so that means that you're just going to keep on, uh, the moment they ram, you're just going to keep on ramming the creature down until it can't be rammed anymore and most probably the creature is going to be destroyed if the DM allows it. Uh, a creature stuck, a creature struck must make a DC dexterity saving throw with a DC of e equal to 10 plus ship strength modifier, taking the damage based on the ship size. Ship size? As shown in the crash damage table. So that's a reverse. So the that so when a ship crashes into a creature or object, uh, both sides take damage. From for how it reads, yeah, both sides take damage if the if the target if the target fails their saving their deck saving throw, then they then they also take damage uh, based on the ship size. So if if like it's a warship, which is like a four, it's like a gargantuan. Uh, 16d10 on the on a crash target is gonna that's gonna be a lot. Um, I mean, they are obviously monsters. They are above the the two hundred range, but uh, for the most part, I think most creatures are gonna end up pretty pretty beaten up if they take uh, the high range of a sixteen d ten. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's full damage on fail save, half as much on a successful one. All right, standard stuff. Okay, last section. Owning a ship. If you purchase a ship, you have unlocked an exciting new avenue for adventure and sign up for a mountain of logistical challenges. Keeping a ship functioning requires a tremendous amount of work. The ship's uses a downtime activity in managing a ship to abstractly represent the effort needed to keep a ship functioning, its supply stock, and its crew's pay. See the Dungeon Master Card and Zenata's Guide for more information on downtime activities. All right, so these are downtime activities of what have, uh, of managing a ship. Uh, downtime managing a ship by hiring a component comp competent captain and crew and putting them to work to hauling cargo, otherwise offering your services. You can make it possible for a ship to remain in good repair and even generate profit for your between adventures. Managing a ship is a downtime activity that requires time and effort to recruit officer and crew. The ship is available for use when needed. Otherwise, the ship hauls passengers and cargo to cover the cost of maintaining the ship and paying the crew. Alright, uh, I guess this is somewhat similar to the running a business kind of downtime activity. Uh, is that it's so sustaining if, it, if, you, if you let it be. Uh, and I'm not even sure if I'm not even sure if they're allowing like for the PCs to be more hands-on. Yeah, I think it probably should mention somewhere the amount of maintenance it requires. So resources. It takes one week to recruit a crew and one hundred plus four D6 GP to cover the cost of recruitment and supplies. Once you have paid this cost, you have a captain and crew to maintain the ship. So that's not really a lot. 100 GP plus 4 D6, which goes between 4 to 24 gold pieces. Pay 124 gold pieces and you can get an entire crew with captain and yeah, with a, with a captain to get the ship. That's really cheap. That's really, really cheap. Uh, although I probably need to reference later on uh, how much does a boat, does a ship uh, cost to maintain. But Based on this, it doesn't really look all too difficult to own a ship. Okay, resolution. Once you have a working ship, it turns a small profit each month. At the end of every four weeks, you earn five D20 gold pieces. So yeah, so just buy it. So just on based on this alone, just buy a ship, get to pay 120, 124 gold pieces, and then it makes back five D20 gold pieces in, in four weeks. So, you're looking at the potential of 100 gold pieces maximum. And therefore, that means that they could, they could technically pay itself back like in two weeks if possible. 100 in the first week and another 100 in the second week and you're pretty much done. Uh, so, this might be a very big loophole for players. They'll be looking to use this to their advantage. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I, I think this one needs to be uh, studied a little bit more and seen actual action, but based on, on paper, it's really not a good thing to, to have or not a really well designed one from this aspect. Alright, complication. A ship owner runs the risk of foul weather, a bad trade deal, or mutiny. When rolling to determine your profit, if any of the D20s are one, roll on the ship ownership complications table or the DMA create a suitable. Okay, now that makes a little bit more sense. Um, 5 D20s rolling, uh, rolling ones on them. Uh, yeah, that's actually that's actually quite a likely quite a likely thing to happen. So, yeah. So let's look at the complications that could happen. Uh, these roll a D6. Uh, get a one. Your crew makes a bad bargain. You see no profit this month. Wow. Okay, that's pretty bad. Uh, roll two. Your ship and crew have been pressed into military service to hunt pirates for one D four months. Okay, that's pretty bad. Uh, that's kind of like 1d4 months lost worth of revenue. Uh, 3. A temple related to sea, of, sea or trade has accused your crew of disrespect, disrespecting the gods. And no one will do business with your ship and crew. You lose 5d20 GP per month for 1d6 months or until this temple is mollified. Okay, that's pretty risky. Like... Not only you lose your source of income, you actually have you even have to pay for it. Okay, now things are starting to make a bit more sense. Uh, rule of four: your ship and crew go go missing and must be rescued from their captors, and you're kind of like almost close to losing your ship. 
Number five, your crew mut mutinies and is on the run from you. So that's uh, effectively lost the ship. And number six, your crew is caught smuggling illegal goods, they are imprisoned and your ship is impounded. So basically I think four, five, six is just it's just a way of saying uh, you've lost your ship and you have kinda of have to do something about it. So that actually makes the ownership and risk very pretty high in my, my understanding. Uh this roll uh, roll a one on your five D twenty monthly mon uh, monthly profit, and if I'm guessing for each, okay, it's only one complication, but it's, it's a half chance. It's still half chance for you to lose your ship, uh, and out of the remaining one to three, two two out of, two out of three of those are really bad options in the sense that. No, actually, all are bad options. Uh, even the even you get a one, you don't make any profit out of that month. So just the moment of just rolling a one out of five d twenties, just it's just a bad deal overall. Uh, yeah, that actually makes, uh, ship ownership a pretty risky business. Like, uh, you have could have spent one hundred twenty four to get your entire crew, not it not added on to the usual cost of maintenance and and uh, ship ship ownership like ship purchase and it's not a very stable source of income uh it could be a it, and it's not and even the amount of income that you get is you know not not entirely sure to to justify the kind of risk that, that's involved uh okay that makes it a bit more interesting as a downtime activity uh i mean it's kind of it kind of like encourages players to be like built to build like a entire empire of ships a fleet of ships, uh, ships, that you know, uh, to spread out the cost, the spread out the risk and all that. Okay, um, that's the end of the whole thing. Um, I'm talking for an hour. So, I don't know. Um, for me, is this a is this the basis of a ship naval campaign? I not. I still think it's not. Um. Uh, it's not flavorful enough for me. Uh, the mechanics are pretty basic for, for me, I feel. Uh, kind of reminds me of 3.5 where they had an entire supplement just based on uh, naval and sea related things. Uh, obviously, that's like they had an entire book to dedicate to that sort of thing, but uh, I was kind of hoping that uh, Wizards would take a lot of exam take a lot of inspirations from there to make ship more more fun in a way rather than being more procedural and uh adding on and you know despite this despite adding on to whatever current mechanics of travel and uh monsters and downtime activity they have right now uh i still think it's a little bit too complicated than it needs to be uh, or at least it's or at least or at least they're yeah, covering bases which i think can be done a bit more elegantly or at least in a more fun way uh, of resource management. So I guess yeah, there are still a lot of there's still some questions that I would have for, for, for people who are using these rules. Uh, the quality score thing is really you know uh, unintuitive from the moment from the way I see it. I definitely want someone to show show it to, to, to prove it to me or show it to me. Uh, how to get a better quality score to make things a bit more worthwhile and I guess there are also a few like basic things that are not really clear about like who actually controls the ship like even though the even though each character is given the specific roles but who actually has the say on uh, how this how the travel speed is de is determined uh, what downtime acti who has the say on who can do the downtime activity and um, who determines what uh, who determines what activities can be done? Yeah. Uh, so overall, you know, uh, very basic. It's still very very basic. Uh, set of rules. Uh, definitely, definitely can use can use a lot of expansion on. Uh, but. 
if this is done, if this sec if this section uh, is done well or is part of a larger book of of additional rules, uh, yeah, then I would definitely want to see a bit more expansions. But if it's like for an adventure, like just a minor mechanic for an for an adventure, uh, which I would have argued that this would have this would have been perfect to put into Tomb of Annihilation because there was a travel link bit from Waterdeep to Chalt, and generally I think like if if uh, if this was added into Waterdeep. Uh, it will be it, it's a it will be an interesting addition uh, that p uh, p players would be able to travel outside of water deep uh, by by sea uh, rather than just by land uh, yeah so yeah I guess that's all I have to really say for now for uh, this Anafakana uh, I prob I'm, I'm obviously not, not going to rate it like on on a what basis but I've already sh pretty much shared my thoughts on how it works and how I envision it to work so yeah so i guess i'll just stop here for now uh i'll be looking forward to the next anafakana and i'll be this will be one of my consistent series uh when a new anafakana comes out i'll try to do like uh just to go through and talk about it a bit more uh i'm not sure if i'm gonna like try to go back to some of the previous anafakanas yet Maybe if I think that particular Anafakana has a has a more interesting role to play in a future supplement when they announce them. But from I'll we'll just I'll just take this as my starting point and we'll see where we go from there. So yeah, so I guess that's all I have to say for now. So this is the Questing GM signing out for now. Have a great night.